Hey, welcome to the Economy and Politics show where we discuss key socioeconomic developments as it affects households. Today, our conversation will focus on the Nigerian foreign exchange challenges and implications for businesses. And our guest is Mr. Johnson Chuku, a financial analyst and group managing director of Carrier Asset Management. It's great to have you on the program, Mr. Johnson Chuku, after a while. Thank you for having me. Good day. Yes. Before we begin our conversation, let us give you some of the key stories from last week as it concerned the economy. The Federal Executive Council announced the approval of development of the Badagri Deep Sea Port through a build, own, operate, transfer public private partnership model. The project sum is $2.594 billion to be fully financed by private investors with a concession for the period of 45 years. Also last week, the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Isa Pantami, said he's against attempts by the federal government to introduce a 5% excise duty on telecommunication services. Speaking at a recent forum in Lagos, Pantami stated that the telecom sector already contributes a lot to the national economy and urged the government to consider taxing other sectors of the economy that were not contributing to national development. If you are joining us, it is the Economy and Politics Show, and our conversation is around revisiting Nigeria's foreign exchange challenges and implications for businesses. My guest is Mr. Johnson Chuku, a financial analyst and group managing director, career asset management. So Johnson Chuku, let's first begin with understanding the impact of the foreign exchange market challenges we are facing on sectors in the economy. Some of these sectors are key drivers, like manufacturing, aviation, agriculture, and what we call the golden goose, like we stated in the news, uh, the information and communication technology sector. Particularly, we've seen some signals from the aviation sector where some businesses like airlines are saying that they may not continue their service here because of the challenges they're facing in the foreign exchange market. So how is this generally impacting businesses and sectors of the economy? Okay, let's start from the manufacturing sector, which is the second largest employer of labor in the country beyond agriculture, after the agricultural sector. Uh, the manufacturing sector is go going through some difficulties. One is there is a difficulty in assessing effects beyond the fact we are seeing a depreciation of local currency. It's also, it takes a long time for manufacturers to assess the efforts they require to pay for uh, input materials like uh, uh, their fee stock, um, that is their, um, their stock, uh, as well as to pay for machinery equipment or machineries. So, and this limits the ability to produce. Then beyond that, the fact that we are seeing the currency depreciate also means that learning costs of many of the raw materials for those that are imported raw materials keep increasing. And at some point, it becomes difficult because the income of the average consumer is not increasing. It becomes difficult for them to pass on that increased cost to the, uh, to the consumers. So it will, it will lead to a thinning of their margin. And if care is not taken, it could push them into losses. So for the manufacturing sector, it's a challenge for them. And for those that even have the benefit of uh, spontaneous credit from their suppliers, uh, it worsens matters because by the time they finish selling their goods, they are exposed to an FX position. And um, by the time they try to buy that FX to cover that position, they end up creating uh, foreign exchange losses uh, in their balance sheets uh, and PL. So that, that's a challenge we have in the manufacturing sector. Moving to the aviation sector, of course, we're already seeing local aviation companies uh, increasing their tariff almost on a weekly or monthly basis. And even at that, they are having difficulties paying for uh, for ATK or aviation fuel, uh, principally because the price of aviation fuel has gone up as a result of depreciation of local currency and uh, added to the fact that supply of um, petroleum products globally have suffered some constraint due to the war going on between Russia and Ukraine. So for them, the, virtually all their expenditures are dollar denominated, maintenance of aircraft, um, um, payment of uh, um, expatriate crew, and these aircraft have to go for certain uh, checks, including the sea check that are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, all their parts, spare parts are uh, dollar denominated in terms of paying for them. So the airline industry is also going to difficult. Of course, we've seen a closure or uh, withdraw one, withdraw one, suspension of a license of one of the airlines and the other one willingly or it, um, uh, 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 stopping their operation because of the difficulties they're currently encountering. Um, even the international airlines, they are also constrained, uh, uh, complaining that they are not able to re repatriate their ticket sales. Uh, and some of them are reducing the, 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 the frequency of their flights coming from, uh, from Nigeria, uh, like Emirates. 
So that sector is going through difficulties. The ICT sector is also going to face challenges. ICT sector, you realize that because of the paucity of our uh, infrastructure supply, that virtually all the set sites are fueled by uh, uh, diesel. Uh, and then uh, beyond the supplementary uh, uh, power supply source, which is uh, some of the batteries. But the batteries can't uh, sustain those um, cell sites. So the, uh, the ICT companies have to rely on this one that is quite expensive today to power their cell sites. Mm. Again, the ICT companies also pay for data because most of the data you have here actually originated from Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, or Western countries. They also pay for that data uh, with dollar. So if they can't, uh, if the value of Naira keep depreciating, that means the revenues they earn from data services and voice services are no longer of the same value that it used to be. And therefore, they may get to a point where even the values they get from voice and data will not be enough to pay for the uh, the cost of that, that data service that they, 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 are, they are actually selling. So you have to deal with that beyond the sharp increase in the operating costs. And um, this, uh, uh, some of the challenges the sector are facing, but if you go to the agricultural sector, ideally agricultural sector should actually be the beneficiary of uh, what is going on today to some extent. Assuming we're not having the same, this level of insecurity and we're able to produce uh, sufficient food to feed the country. Then what would have happened would have had a kind of substitution of um, uh, food items from important food items to local food items. Uh, and that would have encouraged or stimulated, improved the price of these local food items as well as encouraged production. But unfortunately, we are not having that production because of the heightened level of security in virtually all the three northern regions, and which is already creeping down to the southern regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite, quite a huge challenge. I, I just want to ask you, because we've always heard this from the international uh, development agencies, whether it's uh, International Monetary Fund, even World Bank speaking on the issues around uh, currency, particularly International Monetary Fund, which is more concerned around the currency, the issue of convergence. And uh, government has also talked about it. We've listened to some presidential candidates talk about it. But it's convergence at this point, more of wishful thinking than the reality considering the wide gap between the official rate and private uh, markets. You know the issues of round tripping. So today, if uh, it's uh, 416 or say 420 at official rate, one gets it, buys it, and then goes to sell at the power market at about 620, 660. That's really, really huge profit. And you see a lot of people doing that kind of thing, which needs to be addressed. But from the perspective of the convergence, is that a reality? Yes, it is a reality. Um, what, what, what should ordinarily happen is that the central bank should maintain a single exchange rate. And that exchange rate should apply to all transactions carried out in foreign currency in the country. Uh, what that means is that those who are enjoying the benefit of getting the subsidized rate is actually getting subsidy. And if we have a single exchange rate, I wouldn't call it a convergence. I want to just say eliminate the multiple exchange rates uh, and then fund the market to the extent you can. It's basically going to be a matter of demand and supply. Mm -hmm. And um, to the extent you can, which will determine what the rate will be. But one of the things you gain is, one, uh, at the uh, governmental levels, you're going to have increased liquidity and the uh, capacity of the government to meet its obligations in local currencies, because they're going to get dollars, uh, dollar earnings converted to Naira at higher uh, rates. But most importantly, uh, the subsidy that the people are enjoying in terms of the exchange rates will be eliminated. Yeah. So clearly, um, uh, given that there is, you cannot completely prevent uh, interflow or cross flow of funds from the multiple market segments. Um, so the appropriate thing is uh, eliminate the other uh, uh, exchange rates and have a single rate and uh, whatever uh, however, to whatever extent you can have, you have the capacity to keep the uh, rate stable, you do. Uh, of course, we know um, that with that, uh, you are going to eliminate those people who are around tripping, which would to some extent cut down on the demand. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Mr. Jones, I'm going to ask you around the factors because it's very important to always know the symptoms and how uh, 
uh, they can be addressed head on. Uh, according to ProShares, uh, what to expect first of August uh, uh, report and analysis of the markets. It highlighted what analysts have shared. And let's first start with Father Central Bank admitted, or from his perspective, said that the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, since it's no longer remitting to the federation account, uh, that's a challenge in terms of foreign exchange. But of course, analysts also raised issues around the ways and means of Central Bank of Nigeria, which has ex is exceeded uh, now 19 trillion naira. Issues around low capital importation, which of course has been a challenge. They even say that I think by uh, third quarter of 2023, maybe we may see a, a traction in terms of improvement in capital importation. And then of course the issues around politicians uh, holding uh, the dollar currency ahead of the elections and excess demand for personal travel allowance and business travel allowance of Nigerians uh, going abroad. And of course the concerns that we've raised on rising global inflation fueled by uh, food costs and energy costs stemming from the Russia-Ukraine aggression. So from your perspective, what are those key factors and uh, how they can be quickly addressed at this point? You know, uh, you know for me, um, a couple of things we, uh, we dwell on as symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. The issues around speculations, holding of currencies, uh, people demanding for, for excess demand for uh, travel allowances, personal travel allowance, business travel allowance, are principally because People are worried that the currency may not remain uh, at current levels because foreign currency, foreign capital flow has weakened. And because foreign capital flow has weakened, I mean, when you talk of capital flow, I'm talking of foreign currency re re uh, uh, receipts have actually slowed down drastically. And the core of our foreign uh, currency receipts is uh, export of crude, which accounts for about 90% of our, our foreign exchange earnings. So the first thing is what can we do to improve? on export of crude or they store crude production to about two million barrels and the, we know the issues and we know the issues are around the all in bearing assets who don't feel that they are uh, they have stake in the national interest that there's a harmony or alignment of the interests of the all in bearing communities with the others of the national of, of the nation so we need to meet that alignment the oil producing communities should have a share of what is produced from your area in terms of quality of life there uh, and then how it impacts uh, the environment. So if we can address that, we should be able to improve on crude production. If we improve on crude production, a lot of other things that we are seeing as symptoms will begin to take shape. One is that if you have improved crude production because you have elevated oil prices today, then you're going to see an accretion to your reserve, possibly a stabilization of your exchange rate. And if the exchange rate stabilizes, Nobody will have a compelling need to go and hold dollar because if the outlook is that even Nana will appreciate, I can tell you that even if anybody is keeping dollar for whatever reason, the person wants to sell now so as not to be caught up in an appreciating currency. Two, there won't be any need for anybody to go and front load your BT or PTA uh, purchases. And so these things we are looking at as their symptoms. Even the issue of capital importation, um, one of the things you have to look at. What is the liquidity in the FS market when you talk about capital importation, particularly for foreign portfolio investments? And a lot of people who came in got trapped for a long time. But if you have a robust reserve and this capacity of the central bank to intervene in the market to submit demand will be enhanced. So that will encourage foreign portfolio investors to come in. Even those who are buying into your local instrument, they will know that there will be some level of stability in the exchange rate even within the time of their within their investment uh, period. And you are going to see enhanced capital importation into the country. So these are factors that have to be addressed from the core of the problem. Very, very important. Very important. Now, Mr. John Stuka, I want to ask: Should we revisit the uh, 41 items where that the Central Bank of Nigeria said should not be provided foreign exchange? That we should boost capacity to be able to produce? Because, of course, the challenge around foreign exchange uh, issues is productivity. You've talked about uh, crude production. We also seen the central bank say we need to boost non-oil exports, and we've seen the uh, RT200 uh, program, which uh, just recently, according to data, uh, had influence of two billion dollars. Um, creative ways of really moving forward uh, beyond crude production and these 41 items issues. Is there need to revisit it in terms of productivity and value creation? 
Okay, what I would say in the first place is that what the, the for, banning of one item was part of the demand management strategy of the central bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that the demand management strategy has not worked if there's no complementary supply improvement. Mm -hmm. And if it had worked, we wouldn't be talking of about 650 naira, 660 uh, that got up to 720 last week. Yeah. Um, so we need to uh, review our approach to FS management. And in reviewing it, a lot more emphasis we should be focused on supply management, and which is why I talked about improving crude oil production, which for me is a short route, uh, what I may call, call short term measure that the government can take. In, uh, take. The issues about RT200 getting any $200 billion uh, for in the next three months from export of non crude uh, products, non oil products, it's for me uh, a long term dream. The timeline specified looks to me unrealistic, because if you have to be a producer of uh, finished goods, you yeah. must be able to produce at costs that are competitive with products, similar product producers as well. Yeah. Not only competitive costs, it must also be of the same quality or better quality with comparable products produced as well. And we don't have the infrastructure today to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So um, anybody who is uh, betting on achieving the 200, RT 200 in three years, well, I would say the person, I would the person luck. I'm not that optimistic, uh, but of course I am patriotic. Yeah, I, I like the way you put it. You're not optimistic, but you mean patriotic and you are being realistic from your own perspective, which is very good. We need to have healthy debates on the economy, with, with whichever divide you are, so that we can move forward. As we wrap up, uh, Mr. Johnson Juku, what's the implication for attracting more private capital investments into the economy? Because I know you're one of the advocates of, let's have more private capital into the economy, so that we can move uh, the economy forward. Because government itself trying to drive the financing of infrastructure, for example, which you've um, analyzed in several fora, is not really easy. And just like we said in the news, I mean, there's a development of Baragui Deep Sea Port, and they're looking at public-private sector partnership. So what must happen to encourage investors to come on board and support a good economy with the concern about the foreign exchange markets? You know, my take is that that actually should be the focus of the government in terms of infrastructure development. When you mentioned the Baragri Deep Sea Port, uh, where private sector investors are to put in $2 billion, I can imagine if the federal government already wants to do a project of $2 billion, we're not going to be in the next five years, yeah. given the positive resources available to the government. So, what we should do, we need to develop a proof of concept. We need to come up with a legal and commercial framework for concession of commercially viable infrastructure to private sector operators. And that way, we're going to bring capital, we're going to build the infrastructure, we're going to get the benefit of the infrastructure in terms of cost reduction in operating cost reduction, efficiency, quality of life, quality of service. We're going to get those benefits and we're going to pay token in terms of um, uh, charges for those services if we have strong regulatory environment uh, to also strong regulators to, uh, to regulate the uh, PPP schemes. That should be the priority of the government. Uh, if you look at the finances of the government in the first five months of this year, it was the uh, first four months of this year, it was quite uh, worrisome. Mm -hmm. If the government could spend 1.94 trillion, uh, trillion naira on uh, subsidy, and uh, sorry, 2.94 trillion naira on, uh, on um, uh, well, not subsidy, on um, uh, debt, debt service, mm -hmm. and had a deficit and end on the 2.6 trillion naira, and I had a deficit of 310 uh, trillion naira between total revenue and debt service. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the government still went ahead and spent about 1.27 trillion naira on personnel cost, and another 770 billion on uh, on um, uh, um, on capital projects, ending up with a burden of 3 trillion naira at the time when debt service was already higher than revenue. So we can't continue that trajectory. We can't continue to dig when we're in a hole. We must find way to, ways to stop the digging and then begin to stabilize this system. And that will come from uh, attracting private capital into critical infrastructure. I mean, uh, it's very clear from what you said, Mr. Johnson Chuka, and I believe that policymakers and all stakeholders are listening because we have to address this foreign exchange market in a very pragmatic way. Uh, it's good to be optimistic, like you said, mostly patriotic and pragmatic and engage all key stakeholders on moving it forward. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Johnson Chuku. 
of course, a financial analyst. Well sought after in the country. Uh, Group Managing Director of Career Asset Management. We appreciate what you do in trying to provide perspective analysis and also support the development of uh, private sector investment and support to our economy. And we hope that we can always, uh, as we also always engage, this can be practicalized and move our nation forward. Thank you once again for the time. My pleasure. Thank you. To all our viewers, the foreign exchange market is under the purview of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And a major takeaway is that Nigeria needs to be a productive economy to diversify its foreign exchange earnings from crude oil dependency. This requires an alignment between the fiscal and monetary policy authorities to boost non-oil exports, while it also, of course, for our conversion needs to improve the supply management approach in FX so that we can get more inflows. So that will be all for this edition of the Economy and Politics Show. And if you have questions, comments, or suggestions on what we discussed today, you'll be visiting Nigeria's foreign exchange challenges, implications for businesses. Please send your questions, views, or suggestions to the email displayed on your screen. Also, you can visit our website, www.proshare.co, to get all the latest economic stories, reports, analysis, particularly around monetary policy and, of course, foreign exchange, well captured on our website. And also, you can follow our social media platforms displayed on the screen. Thank you for being part of the show. Till we come your way again. Thank you for watching. Have a lovely day.